All right, folks, round two of the RSP Film Room. This is number 72 with my guest, Reception Perceptions, Matt Harmon of also NFL.com and footballguys.com. We just finished a round of watching Sterling Shepard, a favorite in the draft community. Today, or this episode, tonight, we are going to watch Cal's Kenny Lawler by Matt's request. So, Matt, what's up with Kenny Lawler? Why are we, why are we watching him? Yeah, so kind of the same thing like we talked about at the beginning of the Sterling Shepard episode. This was a guy that I didn't know anything about when I when I started watching him, and I had really heard nobody you know in the draft community really talking about him. But I, like I said, I've just been kind of going like I'm going off like one set of rankings, you know, and I'd always seen him kind of like in that middle of the pack. But like again, a guy that nobody ever talked about. And then I I watched him. I watched the first game of him, and I was really impressed and just was you know and when I say like and I because I tweeted this out I'm like I was really impressed with this guy you know uh, that doesn't mean that like oh my god I think I just found a first round pick but I was yeah I was relative you know impressed relative to what I expected going into it which was nothing because I hadn't heard anything about him so I think that he falls under um I was talking with Russ Russell Clay about this and he writes for PFF does a lot of good work with the college guys and we were talking back and forth about it and I said I think he uh I said I think I think Kenny Lawler uh is part of my uh part of the affliction of my crabtree syndrome which if you don't know anything about my work um I one of the guys I was really high on last off season that nobody was really nobody else was really on was Michael Crabtree because he had just a fantastic reception perception because he's a great clean route runner he's not a great athlete he doesn't make a ton of wow plays though he is does have very strong hands in traffic um, and all that but what makes him what made him have this big rebound career or rebound year with the Raiders was that he is a very advanced timing player a guy that I know you've written about that players at the senior bowl have told you they look at him as kind of an example of how to run good routes you know how to be a timing nuanced player in the nfl and he got together with a quarterback that's more adept at doing that than colin kaepernick and lo and behold he has a a a bounce back year and that was really what i had predicted all along and a guy that really nobody was on but those are the guys that they get like when i watch those guys then obviously because i chart Every route, you know, and I'm so I'm watching these guys like who are who is consistent on a route to route basis. That's Crabtree, and I thought I saw a little bit of that in Kenny Lawler. So I, that was what I was telling Russell was I think he's part of my Crabtree syndrome. Is is what I've started to affectionately call it. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, and I mean I've certainly watched a couple of games. I've seen the Texas game, which is one of the options we can watch tonight. Um, but we and then I've seen him against UCLA, and you're going to see a guy who like Crabtree also can make plays at the catch point yes. in ways that are that are and that's a nice combo you know Marvin Jones is another one we talked about before who tends to be a favorite of mine I bring up a lot but it's because he can run routes but he can also win at the catch point and and make some of those rebounder type of plays when called upon so I think Lawler has some of that in him <laughs> yeah, and, and super productive guy too. He had 13 touchdowns and I think about 900 yards this year. And and one thing that I when I mentioned about him because I tweeted about him and I started getting some responses. You know, Ian Wharton mentioned he's another guy who does great work with cornerbacks, kind of the antithesis of what I do. Um, he mentioned that he kind of his production tailed off. You also have to remember that he did suffer an injury in the Oregon game and then was like apparently he bruised his buttocks or something, which sounds like it would hurt. Um, I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, and so then apparently was limited, you know, kind of going down in the next couple of games, I think against Arizona, Arizona or Arizona state or something else. And, or anyways, but yeah, so just something to remember why he, you know, maybe that's why he's not really talked about as much. He didn't finish quite as strong as he did, uh, start the year, but yeah, no, interesting player. I got also, I will, I will note that one thing that a lot of people shot back at me when I said something about him, like, yeah, but he's got drop issues. And that's like my, that's my, that's a hot button, hot button topic for me is, is the drops. And like, I, I think I've said this to you before I said it and we've talked a little bit Let's about the it. Rant you know. again, Cause I want to hear it. Okay. So I just hate when I, and I, this is what I said. I was like, if you start a conversation about a wide receiver with me and you, it starts with drops. I think you're starting it from the wrong place. Like, because for one, just on simple percentages alone, like even if a receiver drops 10 passes in a season, which 
that's like that's considered a lot. Like you, a lot of drops is like you get the double digits. If they're a guy that gets a ton of targets, you know, more often than not, they're likely catching more than they drop. And I understand that you know drops are can be a drive killer, but that's what I think the problem is. Is that when you tend to just like if you just watch tape, like we like you and I are doing right now, like we're just gonna watch these games. If that's the extent of your process, and I, you and I obviously both go deeper than that, but if that's the extent of your process and you're just watching games, or even more so just watching a game on Sunday, and you rec- see a receiver drop a pass, you have a very negative, visceral reaction to it. And that tends, to, just like in a real life event, like you can go to a restaurant and have nine great meals, but that tenth one is going to, that tenth crappy one is going to stick out in your mind so much more and so I always like to frame the conversation around a receiver what does he do well you know and then okay is that enough to live through the drops because there are plenty of receivers like Ted Ginn is a very extreme example but even Kelvin Benjamin Terrell Owens is kind of like the way big example like you know this guy's a hall of famer Brandon Marshall has a ton of ugly – oh, he had some ugly drops this year. Chad Ochocinco or Johnson, you know, was yeah. another one like that. Even Amari Cooper is a, is a great example, a guy that I think led – you know, according to some sites, led the league in drops this year. But are you really – is that really where you're going to start the conversation with Amari Cooper? Or are you going to start it with the fact that he's – incredibly polished for a young receiver, that sort of thing. So I understand that drops are a big issue, you know, and that's why I think people are really down, you know, on, on Jordan Matthews. But again, it's – well, there are more things going on with Jordan Matthews. But, but, but in general, like, I think that that's – unfortunately, I think that's what really gets stuck in people's minds is drops. And, and I think there's just so much more of a contextual conversation to have there. For one, does he have other – does he have a trump card? You know, that's important. Does he have – other things that make the drops livable. Can you live through the drops? Is it, is it a negligible? Is it something you could be like, well, that's neg- the drops are negligible because he does all these other great things for me. And also, drops are not all created equal. You know, like some guys have concentration drops. Some guys have poor technique. And you have to decide, you know, what can I fix? Is this a fixable thing? Because some guys have drops and then they don't have drops. And then other guys will have it for their entire career. So I just don't like... It just, it drives me up the wall, you know, and as much as I watch receivers, if you're going to come back to me and say, well, his biggest problem is he's dropped these five passes. Okay. But you know, if he's creating good separation in his routes, more often than not, if he's making plays in traffic, if he's great in the contested catch game, but he drops a few routine passes, honestly, I don't care. I'll take the good with the, I'll take the bad with the good because the good is so much more important. So I could, I could literally rant hours and hours and hours on this it's something that i've i feel very very passionately about but you know i just i and i don't know there's some guys i think that martavis bryant's a great example of a guy that people label him as a guy that has drop issues and he'll certainly drop a pass every now and again but i mean the guy's getting he's getting passes thrown to him in the most highest highest degree of difficulty situations and he doesn't come up with a pass and you hold that negativity against him far too much, in my opinion. And I'm not, you know, that's uh, some people do that, and I think it's well, unfair. And I think let's let's call Bloom what let's call Bloom when we see it here. Our buddy Sigmund Bloom, the paranoid Steelers fan, because he's <laughs> a good example. Bloom, I love you. We love you. Just I'm just saying, you know, he's a perfect example of the Steelers fan who gets like he does. I just don't like how he approaches the ball, and it's just like okay. Your Steelers well, it's, fan is all right. And it's not him either. There are a few other people on Twitter that are, you know, Steelers fans or Steelers writers that are that'll tell you, like, I was a little disappointed by Martavis Bryant this year. And it's like, are you kidding me? I mean, come on, the the the, the good so far outweighs the bad. And I'm not saying that Martavis Bryant is perfect. He, he could work on, you know, contested catches. That's a, one of the things that I think like if he if he straightens that out. Look out, because I mean, as far as running routes, as far as explosiveness, and just you know, I mean, pure athleticism, you don't need to tell you about. But I think he's much more polished as a as a guy getting releases off the jam and everything like that, much more than people think. So uh, again, yeah. we're pointing you're, you're pointing to 
Well, your point, because I like to think of everything not on a per. This is a whole nother rant, and this is channeling Adam Harstad, uh, who wrote a great piece on this uh, football guys about how efficiency stats are overrated. I don't like to look at things on a per target basis because, again, you're isolating a small, small sample size off of you know the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of routes that they run in a season. So when you break it down on a per route perspective, which is their job, running routes, not. Not it's that's the biggest part of it. That's what they're doing on almost every pass play is running a route. So, so he dropped ten passes on like you know three hundred routes, and that's being conservative. Come on, that's your. It's such a small, minuscule factor. If that cannot be the first bullet point you talk about about a wide receiver, well done. And two things <laughs> I'll I'll note about this. One is uh, in regards to Adam's article, you cannot evaluate wide receivers or expect wide receivers to perform like accountants okay that efficiency reports is not you know is not the way to look at the receiving game maybe it is for certain areas of manufacturing or accounting but it's not for this type of arena and martavis no. Bryan is someone who liked martavis Bryan coming out in the draft i honestly think year two he was ahead of schedule yes um, i agree so you know, I thought he was ahead of schedule year one. So I'm, you know, I he was a he's a talented guy who did who you could see the glimpses, and I think he's shown glimpses and consistency of big plays. And I, you know, if you're expecting him to be Randy Moss, then you ju your expectations are too high. Exactly, that's and that's that's so unfair. Like I feel like. As soon as he started garnering those comparisons, then it's then it's that's what we're comparing him to. Yeah, it's like it's, we have it's, to keep in mind that this is a, an incredibly raw player in only his second year. Yeah, that's he. We're devaluing. You're also devaluing Randy Moss, and you yeah. can devalue him for whatever you want to devalue for him. Devalue him in terms of whether you liked his attitude or like the didn't like the maturity or you felt like he took plays off or whatever other arguments that the media generated and fans generated about him but there will never be another randy moss when no. it comes to the things that he did well never no. not that no. combo so and, all right and just just one last point right. on this before before we it's before tough. we continue with lawler um this is why this is why reception perception exists this is why i did it because we're ju we need to judge receivers on what they do on a route to route basis, not, you know, what they did on a, I, I know it's a lot more work than going to pro football reference and, you know, exporting a, a, a spreadsheet and dividing their yards per target or whatever. I, I know it's a lot more work, but that's why I'm here to do it for you. I mean, Alan Robinson, great example, a guy that was like his yards per target or fantasy points per target as a rookie or fantasy points per snap was nothing to write home about was not good. But then, but that, but then you go and look at the tape. You look at what he did. His reception perception score as a rookie, outstanding. That's how you identify what a player is, not, you know, the like the accounting approach, which I really like that way of looking at it. Well, good, good, because so, I mean, okay. I you know that's yeah, that's how you go. <laughs> All right, so Texas or Utah, those are our two options. What do you think? Let's go with Texas because it's the one that caught my eye, and I did think that I'd like people to see that as well. Okay, let's do that. All right, so to let everybody know. You know, in a after we do our little talk show format, I let everybody know that the videos here posted at the RSP Film Room are not hosted on the server, and the um, the original video content is not considered to be the property of the RSP Film Room, um, and the the videos are to considered to be used under the fair use doctrine of the United States Copyright Law, Title 17, U.S. Code sections 107 through 118, and the videos used on the site are used for editorial and educational purposes only and RSP film room and its singular staff do not claim ownership of any original video content. The RSP film room and its staff don't use these video clips in advertisements, marketing, or for direct financial gain. All the video content in each of this clip, these clips are considered to be owned by the individual broadcast companies. And without further ado, let's bring up this episode of Kenny Lawler versus Texas. Get it on the screen, present it to everybody, and draft breakdown, you guys are awesome. I'm using the YouTube option just because I'm a fuddy-duddy, but you need to go to draft breakdown and check them out whenever you can because they put this stuff together and they're absolutely terrific and lifesavers. 
So looking for at sure. that for sure, for sure, for sure. I, I, I didn't get a chance to do this at the senior bowl, but one day at the senior bowl, any of you draft breakdown cats come up to me, I buy you a drink or buy you a meal because you, you have definitely saved me some time. Um, same, same goes for me. If I ever get to mobile, one of these yeah. days, well, well, hopefully that'll happen. We'll definitely, that does need to happen. It'll be a fun time. I'm going to, I'm going to petition to do it for work next year, but we'll see if they think I'm that important. Probably not. Well, I think, I think you should give it a shot and I, I think you could probably do it for your blog even so. Probably. So we'll, we'll talk about that detail offline here, but let's start this sucker off here. We'll get into half speed mode like we do and Get this rolling. We got some single coverage with off coverage. And what are your thoughts about the blocking game at all? I mean, are you, you know, do you get into that much? That is something I will get more into as I start to watch these cut ups. Because, like I mentioned in the Sterling Shepherd, the, so what I've done far is chart from the All 22 uh, at work. So it's something that I would, I would probably withhold commenting on. Uh, at this point, I don't have any obviously like metrics that I create with it, but um, it is important, you know. And I have, but so I haven't. This was one actually. This first play, I remember seeing it and being like, "Oh, that kind of turned me off because it was such like a, it was such like a gross little play there." <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I I get a, I'm getting a little more geeked out about studying blocking um, in the run game. It doesn't mean that you know it's overshadowing what they do as receivers, but you know these are hard plays. I actually think these are hard plays to do because this is a stock block and you have to really gauge patiently when to attack and when to kind of slow down and let the defender come to you. And I think that this little bounce there was tough. You know, I mean, he just kind of reached out there and just threw his shoulder across. He did what he could. He just misgaged it. So it is what it is there. It's one play. We'll see some more of his blocking, I'm sure. Yeah. I didn't think it was something that I saw a lot of. Yeah. Like, here's some good hand position. Yeah. I like, you know, I like this. Let's go ahead and get rid of every drop counts. Isn't that interesting? We talked about oh, drop. Wow. That... <laughs> every drop counts. So, get that out of here. <laughs> yeah. Creepy, huh? Right? You know? So, data mining. There we go. Let's nice. see. Um, You know, off the line, he's gauging. He, needs to, he slides fairly well. And I like that the hands are out and in position here. He may have been able to cut inside a little bit more and square the defender, but you, sh you see some physical skill there, and that's not bad. You, you want to see the effort, and you know he showed the effort until it was pretty clear that his, his teammate was on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll say about Lawler, we're going to see him take almost all of his snaps from, this, from the right side of the, of the field. I think I had 98.5% of his snaps came at right wide receiver in the in the games that I charted. So expect to see most of him do mo him to do most of his work there. Yeah, and we're probably going to skip over a good bit of these blocks and not comment on them from here on out unless I see something especially good. But just some things of note for people: the fact that he's kind of slide stepping across here is good. It, it shows that he's trying to close the gap because you want to close the gap as as tight as you can before you shoot your arms. Ideally, you'd like to see him punch and be maybe a yard closer and throw those hands hard so they can deliver a jarring punch, get the advantage, and grab on to the collar inside the shoulder pads where he's not going to get called for holding, but he can direct the man. Here, he's not as far away as you'd like, but he was patient enough to get pretty close, uses his reach to get under the arms, and then that's easy enough to slide inside if he needs be. You just want to see him close that gap a little bit more than he did. Um, but it's good that he's he was able to lock on and stay focused there. So, I mean, there's some things to work at here to get better at, but there's some things he does reasonably well that he can build on. I actually did a Rorschach episode where I had people guess this play and what they thought happened here. Was this a bad I think, thing? I think this is kind of I think this is kind of a, a poor route by him actually. I, I think uh it, it looks almost like he's a little indecisive to me. 
yeah in this like it, he seeing it again i think that like he gets his foot out so wide like that i think he tips the defender of where like what his intention is and yeah so that that i think is a poor route by him yes and and i totally agree with you that was my vote i gave people three options was it an overthrow was the defender making a great play or was it a poor route and I, I, I voted for poor route, and I think most people did as well. But here's and the way you said about that foot. Now, this is a crossing route. Crossing routes probably you demand either a speed break on this more often than you would see a hard break. And he puts that one foot out there. But when he does, because it's such a wide step, like you said, he's not able to turn his hips here and really get a tight turn. And so he, his, his turn ends up veering him into the defender and tipping off the defender to come inside at the same time. And you end up with this traffic collision. Whereas if he took a shorter step, he could have taken this second step with his inside foot and then come around with his hips. There's a drill mm -hmm. called Carioca um, where you see the, you know, you see football players warming up where they're turning their hips and getting their, their outside leg around. And it looks yeah. like they're kind of doing a dance step. But if that leg was swinging around a little bit more and it wasn't that first step, he wouldn't have veered into the defender like this. And he wouldn't have had to try to reduce his shoulder because he would have probably been breaking about a, a half a yard or earlier. And I think that these are things – I don't think he – I don't think Lawler is an incredibly athletic player. I don't, and so I think that these are things that are good examples to see of where he needs to improve in order to maximize his skill set is these sort of situations, you know, because he's not going to be a guy that is going to, you know, make a bunch of, to you know, overly athletic plays or win with speed or anything. He's going to have to perfect these sort of, you know, nuanced things, much like we saw with Shepard in our last episode. Yeah, it's a great point. And you got to remember, I mean, this is considered an easy, easy play. This is an extension of the run yeah. game, that, you know, here. It's a crossing route, should be under, uh, you know, a tight zone, but still get free. And they can't connect on second and 10, which should have been, you know, at least been a third and five. Now that we're looking at third and 10. So these are plays that keep players on the bench in the NFL if they can't execute. It's very true. Any comments on golf? Have you have you seen him much? Yeah, so I mean, I I think that I obviously I got to do six games on Lawler for his reception perception. I was a little like, I don't know. Again, I'm not watching quarterbacks very closely, but I was a little like underwhelmed with what I saw. I, okay. I wasn't like I wasn't particularly. I think that well, I think Josh Norris made a really good point that like the system seemed very like. He, he was saying that the conversation that people were having with Marcus Mariota and his system last year uh, is one that we should be having with Goff this year. And I did feel like it was – I don't know if it was the offense or Goff that I was disappointed in because I did feel like in general it was like I was really tired of the offense by the end of watching it. And, I, again, I don't know. So I don't know if I'm carrying that over to Goff, but I really have not done enough like for work solely on him to be able to know for sure. No, it makes sense. But I – what do you think? I've heard similar complaints about that. Um, I've also heard from some people inside the league who that there is, you know, I've heard at least about one GM who says all he does is stand back there and just throw passes, you know, in the middle of the field without any issue. But then I've also heard people who I really respect in, in the realm of, you know, scouting in, on a professional level say, this guy actually is for real. The offense thing is people is something people are dwelling on a little too much, and that he actually scores out very well on on um, both a, an analytical and tape study fa fashion. And and this is something that I heard after I've already evaluated him. Um, I have more to evaluate, but thus far he's my top quarterback in this class, and um, I feel pretty good about him. I don't think he's. I don't think he's on the level of Mariota 
or Winston. So if you know it, that feeds into the argument that if people are saying, well, Mariota should have gotten, you know, if Mariota got that scrutiny, so should he. Well, I guess so. I guess I look at it like this. I I I had scrutiny for Mariota, and I like Mariota. I liked Mariota better heading out than I do golf right now. Um, so, but golf is my top quarterback in this class. So that should tell you, yeah. I mean, that, that should tell you something about this quarterback class too, which, yeah. which I think is actually one of the most fascinating ones I've ever done, but it's from a geeked out standpoint of there's no really, you know, to me, Mariota could turn out to be a star quarterback in this league, but he has a lot of things, little things to work on if he's going to not be ramrodded into a little system, into a system that is totally fit for what he did in college. Now, at the same time, golf to me has his range seems to be more around a Philip Rivers, Jay Cutler type of player. You know, moments where he could be really, really good, but you know, he's he may never be what you would consider the top the best of the best. So I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, but he could also be a big flop depending on, you know, where he winds up. Um, but I'm, I'm more of a believer that he's going to be a decent starter in this league that fans will complain about from time to time, but um, he'll be better than, you know, I think half the starters in the league once he really gets rolling and maybe even in the top, you know, you know, maybe in the top third of the league you know, at some point, whereas we've got some players, you know, as we're waiting, we're going to wait for a reception here or a target opportunity. There are players that I like who are in the middle part of this class who I think can develop into starters who might also be able to play in the top third or top half of starters in the league. And they just need more time and a good fit. And they need that um, focused development that may come by accident in the way that say, Oh, I don't know. Kirk Cousins' um, development came right. by accident. Yeah, no. There seems like it. That seems to be kind of the consensus with the class right now is that there's a lot of guys, maybe just not a V guy sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, really intriguing guys, but just you know, no one that stands out to the level that you're just going. I he needs to be the guy for me. But I think three years from now, we might find two or three guys from this class that were like, wow, they could have been drafted higher and I would have been okay with yeah. that. That makes sense. This guy is someone I want you to watch. The 89. Steven, yeah. Steven Anderson. He's a hybrid receiver tight end. And I don't know which way he's going to wind up because he's about 225, I think, 225, 230 maybe. Interesting. Um, but if he turns into a tight end, it'll be a different story. But I would definitely like to see what, what you think about this guy somewhere down the line. I'll definitely try to get a chance to do that. So what do we have here? I mean, because I thought this – I thought the fade sometimes he flashes some really good stuff on fade routes. Yeah, I will say that right now I think he has my second or at least top four score on contested catches. I think that's the strength of his game. So this was I don't and we don't get to see it from a very good angle here, but I think I think this was just a mistiming of the leap, to be honest with you. Like and I think he just went up too late like yeah. which is you know sometimes that's good to be we all we've talked about late hands on our episodes before um and i think that he does generally a good job of that i think he was just too late on this one and i think he gets caught i think the defender does a good job here of catching him at the right moment that makes him kind of stop earlier than maybe he would have wanted uh so i will say that this is a play that is more of an outlier than the norm as far as him making plays in traffic and contested catches and on the fade route especially. Um, but it, it is something that I think that timing was off on this one for sure. I think you're – I agree. Right over here in the corner where the timing was off. And I think the root issue, though, is what we talked about in the last game, which is 
getting the right depth at the top to where you're closing the gap on the defender and forcing the defender's hand in your stem before your break. Because watch this, watch this stem. Watch where he makes his move to break. Right there. Yep. The defenders, this is what, when you have a patient defender um, or a defender who's playing off coverage, making your move three yards away from the defender isn't going to win you separation. That's just, that's way too early. Unless you just made an incredible move on the defender and he doesn't you you've got to close the gap and part of closing the gap is keeping that drive phase until he gets about a yard away instead of and if he was a yard away and made this move the defender is more likely to have to react because he's backing off either because he's maybe being sold more on a vertical route or maybe an inside route but here the defender's like okay let me see what you've got if you make a move i've got enough space to move either direction right now and when he does, it's like now, you know, all Lawler has is let me give you a little forearm to the chest, yeah. turn outside, and I've because I'm giving you the forearm because I didn't beat you, it completely threw off my timing. Yeah, and again, I think these are things because he's not going to make some kind of I don't think again, I don't think he has the athletic ability to make some kind of tremendous move on the defender there, I think that these are things as from a technique perspective that he's going to have to perfect. He's going to have to get better at. Yeah. So we've seen two good examples of that so far. Yeah. And yeah, some people go, well, look, what about the little grab that he had to the back of the Jersey at the end of this? But it's like, look folks, he should never have been in this position. Yeah. Like if he dictates it the way he was supposed to in his stem, this defender does not have his hands on his chest under his chin strap. <laughs> he doesn't get yeah. mugged here. And so you can say, oh, well, the defender did this, but Lawler also controlled his destiny and put himself in a position to get mugged. And I, I think that Lawler comes up with good technique as far as his hands coming up together, like timing, like again, his own internal body timing was fine going up for the ball. He's just late being there. He's just not there on time. Which is important too, I think, if you see a guy that, you know, that has that has poor timing with his hands, like as an, from an individual sense, and then a poor timing, like being in the right, like being in the right place at the right time. I think that was the issue here. Yeah, I agree completely. And you could even argue that once he got ripped and jostled around like this, that he probably overcompensates to get a little too far from where the ball arrives, so that he has yeah. to reach back to it. Because he's like, I got to get away from this contact. Nice headbutt of the cone, though. I got to say, I like that technique very much. You got to like that shit. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, right, I forget. You, I, hey, you are the first in a while. I think we need to have an award for somebody every time that they. I, they, they I forget curse. if it shows PG or not. Yeah, I know. It's okay. I'll put cursing on this one. It'll be okay. <laughs> parental advisory uh, well, there, there's Don't something on YouTube you can say hey look there's there's cursing on this on this episode so don't so, tell Uncle Roger I, I won't tell Uncle Roger at all <laughs> I think if I went to tell Uncle Roger he would probably have a he would probably have a terror uh, have a terrorist unit come investigate me because <laughs> that's probably you wouldn't get you wouldn't, you wouldn't get three feet close to the building I probably wouldn't not at all you know, unless I was, that, unless I shaved and put on a suit and did my hair right, and then no one would even know it was me. So it would be. There you go. All right. That's how, that's my, this is actually my disguise when I, you know, <laughs> I clean up. So when I go out in public to like, I, I clean up and then nobody recognizes me. I guess Vegas doesn't count then. No, because <laughs> Vegas is just like, it's an industry thing. I want people to recognize me. So, you know. All your fans, yeah, you don't want them recognizing you in public. I'm telling you, I went to the Senior Bowl and I got stopped. True, yeah. I got stopped by two NFL players who watched this show or former NFL players because they recognized my look, which was like hilarious. So, I they they almost didn't recognize me because I actually shaved it shaved that uh, that week and trimmed the beard a little bit. So, yeah. 
grooming tips as we go through these these plays that have nothing to do with Lawler at this point or blocks that we're not really going to take a, a huge look at at this stage. Well, I would say he did make a catch on that last one, and one of the underrated things I think about him is that he does he is he will at least like he's again not a spectacular runner after the catch, but he routinely makes the first defender miss. Yeah. So, you know, he's good about that. Like when he gets the ball cleanly and open separation in his routes, he can make at least, you know, the first defender miss. Like he's yes. never going to, I, I chart, you know, how often they break one tackle or how often they break multiple tackles. He never broke more than one, but he routinely broke one, you know, like that was always something he consistently did. And there are a lot of receivers who can't do that. Yeah. And again, it's not from being an overly athletic guy, but I think once he gets the ball in his hands, he's decisive. He's uh, direct about his motions, and I think th I like that a lot about him. Yep. It's about integrating all those skills so that you can get downfield. I mean, that's to me an example of integrated technique. And then we'll see another catch from 89 here, and now we'll move on over and see if we can get him, get Lawler on the outside here. And once again, they're running this combo. Yeah, they do a lot of these sort of plays, which, like yeah. I said, after, after six games kind of got old. You know, I mean, we're, this isn't the rate, this isn't the golf show, but again, this, to me, this is a good example of a player who's under pressure and people talk about the fidgety feet that he has and they don't like his footwork. They don't like how his feet are always tapping, but I think you're missing the context and you're looking at the, um, you're looking at the singular act of his feet kind of jumping around and not thinking about what those feet are actually doing in this case. And what they're doing is constantly adjusting in a way that he's maintaining a base, but moving in micro movements to avoid pressure, to find an open space and deliver the ball in a tight area from a tight area and hit his receiver on his back shoulder so that his receiver actually has room to turn up field and run. That's an underrated play. There's definitely a difference between having choppy, like, like Peyton Manning's a good example. He has really frenetic, choppy, happy feet in the pocket, but there's an intention to it, you know, like unlike a, a you know, a, a Rex Grossman or a Blaine Gabbert that, you know, wilts in the pocket. There's a difference between the two. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just a thought out there for folks who may be wondering about what I think of golf. That's an example of something that I think people overthink. Here's a good example of a play, something I, and, and I can't see whether he, this is, okay, here we go. This is something I, I really liked about Lawler was he routinely knows when to break off a route to come, like, to follow his quarterback. Um, that's one of the things that I score on the route tree just under the other category, is, and that's something that I notice with him a lot. Um, you didn't see him make the reception there, obviously, but you'll you if you watch him on a route to route basis you see this a lot like he'll you know when he this, again, we're different play now but you see you see that a lot from him he he makes a uh, he yeah, makes sure. that he makes that move back to the outside yeah. like to follow along with his quarterback make like to give him a target to throw to like if he needed to throw right now he could right and you see him make make a few catches on that as well too absolutely And this one, this one's a run block, but I like the aggression here. You see him get downhill, you get his hands in a good spot, and he gets a good push. So, yeah, you know, a lot little things that can be better, but that will come with time and work. All right. Now here's the yeah. This is the strength of of his game here. <laughs> yeah. It's a good route to get separation there. 
you're hard charging with the feet and then he's got a great leap and it's strong hands at the catch point. I would be, I'd be interested to know what his hand size is actually. Cause it seems like he has some pretty big mitts and yeah. you, can, you consistently see him win these, these contested catches. Yeah. And the chop thing you mentioned, I really like because, you know, I talked about Braxton Miller having short steps. Well, here's some short steps, right? But watch how much he closes the depth before he makes his, the move. He makes the move. He closes his depth with the defender. And he is, I mean, he's a foot away, knee to knee here. Yeah. The defender, before he makes his inside outside move to get free. And that's, that's being aggressive and attacking. So the choppy steps play into that because he's trying to get the defender to move up to him a little bit. Um, as if he's going to yeah. break short, but he gets close. Make sure he's close enough before he makes that outside move, and that's the within, difference. Within like five yards of the line of scrimmage, I'm more okay with those with those little stutter steps than I am when you're at the break point of your route, which is what I see a lot of receivers try to do. And I think that's that I would say is like a wasted motion. But here, it's crucial to the route and earning separation. And you see Goff. He's ready to let that ball go when Lawler and the defender are, like you said, like knee to knee, because he knows the he knows his guy is going to be able to win this ball and and make that little ex that extra effort to get a a really good amount of separation there. Yeah, and this is just a pretty catch, like you said. Yeah, and the, but even even with the stretching out here, where he's got it high pointed, look at the awareness, the awareness of to turn his back so that he can shield that ball from the defender. Yep. Beautiful. Good catch. Very yeah. good catch. <laughs> <laughs> That's one you want on a poster. That's a posterizing type of catch right there. Again, not even a great hands move, but it's effective. Yeah. And that's, you know, you want, you're looking for effective here. That's the whole point of this. Sometimes effective is with force. Sometimes it's with making contact. He gets the contact on the bicep. And even though he doesn't push down, because he's as close as he is, it was effective. Yeah. And... I think what's what I like about him on that route too is it almost like you, when you freeze frame it at certain points, it like it, like a little after here, it almost looks like he's like you know sitting straight down in a chair, yes. and is able he's got the, he's got the leg drive to come back up, and then that's when he move makes the arm move and gets the separation there. So you you can see he's got some power in his legs there when he uses it right. Yep. He does not skip leg day, going back to Sean Oakman in the last episode. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. All right, so we got ourselves a nice little long run there. Lawler got a little bit of a punch. Maybe a little bit more of a running game here. Let's skip that. Rob likes to show us all the blocks, clearly. Yeah. Rob Rob Donaldson, the guy who cuts the video here. And, Rob, I'm appreciative <laughs> of that. I really am because I, I definitely score that and I evaluate for that. But for tonight's purposes, we're – skipping we're skipping a little bit but i will tell you folks as a blocker he can improve we talked about some of the reasons why if you want to look at it a little earlier in the tape if you skipped around the mentality is definitely there and yeah. that's the first step that's the yeah. that's the key first step his biggest issue is is really closing the gap enough so that he can throw a powerful punch and if he can yeah. learn to do that he could be a very good blocker even though he may not have the beef of of a larger receiver the 
that's a sweet little play. Yeah, there, there's a lot. There's a lot going on there. Um, you know, keeps the de- keeps the defender shallow, and then sits de- like just sits down in the right spot. Like that's great awareness in between the defender there, and then again, the guy miss. You know, and then you. I like a lot of what I see here, and it's great balance along the sideline too. That is that's impressive. Yeah, I mean, this is awareness of. I know I'm backing my way to the sideline. I know I'm close. And I know where this defender is. And still in a split second, knowing how to turn and pivot his feet so that he probably goes out of bounds in midair, but he's able to land in inside the boundary there and then just drag across. Yeah, that's a very athletic play. Yeah. And it's a very – it's just an instinctive – understanding of your body of your the space around you and how to use your body in that space this is what pro players do this is what separates collegians from pros on, on at least on the level of being a ball carrier but little things like this i i call this integrated technique it is an integrated technique to understand and it can extend to athletic ability knowing how to turn and these aren't these this isn't a drill i mean don't i don't think i've ever seen a drill that says okay be prepared for this yeah but there are but there are multiple drills separately that you could say you know turning your hips taking small steps you know maybe spinning in certain situations turning your you know turning your feet like that the way that you just did pivoting your feet in, in air those are separate drills but to put that all together like that that's what makes a football player and not just a guy yeah and we're practice. watching we're watching this you know in a, in a half speed or all that but in the you know this is what they you know they would say it's like a bang bang play sort of thing you know it's like what he and he processes things very quickly in my opinion yeah absolutely all right so we got another block there or missed all right so let's see what we got here second and goal all right moving onward Got the pivot to the outside. Yeah, that's that same sort of thing that I was talking about earlier. He's really good at, at that route. Yeah, and he dives for the boundary. I like, you know, 15 seconds left in this, and he knows he needs to get out of bounds to stop the clock. Good situational awareness. Yeah. All right. Moving onward. So now we're in the third quarter. We've got some potential high low zone coverage here. And we get another pass to Steven Anderson. All right. Seeing a lot of him. Yeah, Steven Steven to the flat Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> The UCLA game's an interesting one to watch of him, I believe, if I remember correctly. Wasn't that? Yeah. I saw I believe that was one of the ones I watched as well. That's a good one. And uh Yeah, there's that uh, that one and the USC game was one that I liked I liked too. The Oregon one is the one that he gets hurt halfway through. Okay. So, yeah. And but USC is a is a fun one to watch as well because it's one he's not super productive and obviously this one is. Here's going up for the ball again. Yeah. And look how early he's at it, making sure that yep. he can shield the defender. Backs to the defender here. He's still going to turn. And, I mean, look at that attack. Yes. You know, the defender's wrapped around him, trying to shoot his arm between the 
you know, at the from the chest between the arms, can't reach it. And that little extra pull of the ball upward rather than pulling it in. Again, just great body awareness of saying, hey, instead of me snatching it and pulling it down, let me snatch it and pull it up and turn away. Yeah, it's pretty textbook right there. <laughs> and uh yeah, I, I like I like again, see that was why I was saying that that one first fade route I think was an outlier play because a lot of these ones that we're seeing now, he's timing things very well. Yeah. As far as when he le like when he turns to shield, when he leaps, when he sticks his hands up, all very, very good timing plays. And I think this is more of what you see from him than that first fade route. Yeah. So I'm, it's important to watch, you know, watch, watch all the games, watch, you know, multiple things and make sure to weigh things appropriately. I felt like I just sounded like a teacher there. I apologize. Hey, that's okay. <laughs> you were going to be one in some ways you are one of sorts right now. That's, that's true. Great tracking the ball too. You know, you can see he's watching it all the way down the sidelines. He's, um, I think that I mentioned the drops earlier. And again, I don't have him at an, an incredibly high, like an alarming drop rate or anything. Not, not at all. Actually, to be honest with you, I think it was in what in the, in the, it was a game against Washington. He drops three passes and all three of them were excruciating, which as I mentioned at the top, that's that negative visceral reaction you have when you see it. So perhaps that's what's sticking in people's heads, but he definitely has some really ugly drops, but Kind of like with Prashad Perryman last year, I actually thought Perryman displayed some really good hands, like at times. And I think Lawler does too. I think it's just a focus issue. Like, yeah. Law, like Lawler doesn't have bad hand technique or anything like that. You see when he's when he makes the drops, like it's just routine, like He's thinking about what he's going to do next because, like I said, he's good after the catch, so perhaps he's readying himself for that. But you can see here, I mean, these are good hands. He's tracking the ball well. It's not an issue like that at all. Yeah, I will argue one point where I do think that maybe his technique could be a little better here, but he, he makes the catch. It's just that see how wide the hands are to yeah. throw the ball? You That's really true. want the hands together because he actually claps right there, yeah. claps his hands on, around the ball. You don't really want to be clap catching. Um, that's a good point. But, yeah, and that actually sounds kind of bad. <laughs> but uh, we can add this to our to the PG-13 episode here. Um, clap catching. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, as, as they would probably have said in World War II. But, uh, yeah, definitely – you don't want to, you know, slap your hands against it like that as much as you want the ball to come or come to your hands with kind of more of a web type of, yes. you know, thing where that your finger, your, your index finger and your palm and your uh, thumbs are almost overlapping to make the catch. And here he's, he's kind of clapping up against the ball. There, he makes a good catch on it, and he gets his hands in the good position. But that's one area that can be improved. But man, do I like him pulling the ball away the way he did there! I just very good awareness. Clap catching. <laughs> Don't put that in your scouting report. That's right. We'll have to call it like penicillin hands or something. Yeah, so <laughs> he's got penicillin hands. How is that? Well, yeah. Hey, NFL NFL.com is a family website. We that's don't we true. don't write like that. That's right. <laughs> so is football guys actually. So there we go. Yeah, that, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. We don't need any parentheses. Sorry, Joe's. That's only for the audible. That's right. <laughs> All right, moving forward here. Now we got him at the top of the screen. Like you said, we often see him from this spot, almost always. Almost always. It's where you don't really see anything there that's just an underthrown ball, it looks to me. Yeah. Yeah. 
and maybe he's held up a little bit. Let's see. No, just just underthrown. Yeah, I think it get, just gets there a little shallow. Yeah. The only question that I might have is, could he have broken the route further inside? And was that something that the coverage would have dictated him to do? And I'd say, based on the position of the safety, the answer is probably no. Yeah. This is more of a getting hit while you're thrown here. Yeah. I mean, there's some pressure. You know, there was a few hands up, too, as defensive linemen. Yep. Right, keep moving along here. Let me see if I can. There we go. Up at the top again. And nothing. And we don't get to see much here, but I, the timing once again, the top of the stem makes his break and he's, yeah. he chops when he's in position to do something effective. You just, again, watch receivers in the college game and you'll see a lot of these guys chop right here. Like, why are you chopping yeah. here? There's no right. reason. But there, he, he waits the right spot. So you're seeing a guy who, again, understands how to maximize techniques around him your techniques and know when to do that with his body and yeah contested catch once again inside out move widens widens the defender a little bit with his stem let's watch it from here we go from the get go forces defender outside with that little that little move mm -hmm. Slips under with the shoulder, looking already back for the ball early. This play is over really yeah. within the first three steps. Absolutely, and the quarterback just puts it up at a good spot. I mean, yeah, this is one of the things that he does well. This is He gets himself in position on these slant routes, and this is a good angle. We'll watch it from here. All right, come on now. Snap the ball off. <laughs> there we go. Nice little yeah. head and shoulder real, fake. Real good. Real good fake there. Good route. Yeah, that's that's dictating where that's dictating where the defender is gonna go by using your eyes and your head. Um yeah. uh, definitely one of the underrated aspects of uh, of route running is is the is the eyes and the head. Yeah. And this is a great example. You know, he's got plenty of, I mean, just, yeah, like you said, it's really over at this point. I mean, he's got miles of space there in the end zone. And, you know, the quarterback is already ready, again, to let it go before he's even there. Yeah, and the chop comes at the end as he's almost yep. passed right there rather it's, than trying to reach across and end up entangling himself. It's almost more, uh, he uses it almost more as a finishing move than, uh, you know, part of the dance. Like, I've already beat you. Now I'm going to put you into the dirt. You know, I'm going to yeah. finish this route. Absolutely. I like the, like the idea of how you stated it as a finishing move. What we saw there in that route, nice job getting his head around, snapping it around quick. And I believe that's basically it here, other than maybe yeah. this last play. Yeah. Just a handoff. Yep. All right. So there you have it, folks. Kenny Lawler. Yeah, uh Interesting player, I think, to me. Uh, again, somebody that I had not heard really any buzz on, and I was a little surprised by that. And I think I think he's the type of player that you could see kind of slip through the cracks. Like, again, just a guy that you know he's not going to be some 
exciting late rounder with a ton of potential. He's also definitely, you know, got enough holes in his games that he's that he's not a first rounder or a second rounder or anything like that. But a guy that you take in the mid rounds and um, I think has potential to, if he develops in some of those smaller, more nuanced areas, ends up as a guy that contributes you know, to a team clearly will offer you some, some high upside moments in, in the red zone with those, with those good routes there. And also in the contested catch game, like a guy that you can throw the ball up to, you know, on a third, something like, again, I just think there's some, there's some strong NFL skills there. One of the ones that I don't think we get to see at all on this tape, but the UCLA game, I think you mentioned, you see it a lot there. He really is very good against zone coverage and is, like he has a great curl route, and that was the highest scoring route I have him on, where he knows when to like come from that right outside and then break into almost like the 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 middle between the hash and the 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 sideline and really make an easy target for the quarterback there. And that was like the Crabtree esque thing that I saw him do a lot um, on film. And so again, I just a guy that I really was surprised I hadn't heard more about that I I saw some pretty exciting things from. Yeah, I would. Another guy I would add to maybe, and it may not match up from an from a statistical or from a from a tracking standpoint for perception reception, but Jeremy Macklin comes to mind for me. Just not as athletic, you know, someone who can win the ball in tight coverage, someone who can get open in the zones, who can make the first man miss, someone who understands how to do certain things with route running to be able to get to get free, um, technically sound. I would say. And yeah. I think there's a lot of technically sound elements to his game that may not be wildly creative, um, but certainly doable. So, yeah, I like him. Um, I'm looking forward to watching more of him as well. I've got, I think, two or three more games on tap for him after watching a couple of his already. Um, but this was definitely fun, Matt. And, I, and, and it, it was fun to kind of cross paths on this one and see where we're kind of at with him. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, Matt, thanks again for being on. And, you My know, pleasure. As we'll always. Yeah, man. We'll definitely have you on a lot more in the coming months. And we'll probably be doing some. Uh, I know I've got a lot of requests for defensive players um, coming up. So I'm going to try and get Dr. Gene on and some Ryan Riddle and some folks on there. But, um, you know, but we will. Uh, you know, you know that it's about the skill players for us. We certainly enjoy uh, certainly enjoy watching that. So it's always a pleasure. And again, folks, you can catch more of the RSP film rooms at the RSP film room, which is the name of the channel on YouTube or at my blog, www.mattwaldenrsp.com. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>